So welcome back students. So in the previous three modules we have seen the introduction to chemical process industries. We have seen the base chemicals, inorganic chemicals and also the process safety aspects and the structure of the chemical industry to be in particular. Then we moved on to the inorganic chemical industries and we gave extensive uh, lectures on uh, both part 1, part 2 which has the ammonia and sulphur and phosphoric acid to name a few. So moving ahead, uh, these were uh, the processes which uh, invariantly uses maybe it is catalytic process or non-catalytic process. I am talking about module 2 and 3. So uh, whether it is catalytic process or non-catalytic process, invariably catalysis is a workhorse in most of the chemical industries. So catalysis process further can be described in two different manners or I will say in phases if it is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So the following two modules will actually cover the heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysis respectively. So today we are going to start our module 4 which deals with heterogeneous catalysis. So uh, what I will discuss here is we will introduce the heterogeneous catalysis. I will uh, lay down what is the difference between the homogeneous catalysis in which way they are different and where it is used. So and then uh, we will discuss this is a major aspect of chemical engineering. I will not say chemical engineering, it is chemical engineering and chemist coming together to design a catalyst because catalyst design depends upon its shape, its size, its porosity, okay, its structure, whether it is uh, hollow type of structure or whether it is a solid structure, all this actually depends, all this actually makes sense because it will then finally the output variable such as the temperature, pressure drop will be governed by this catalytic particles, the size and shape of the catalytic particles. That's So we will discuss the catalyst design extensively and then finally once the catalyst is designed, we will see reactor types. Now the reactor types, it will be again be very comprehensively discussed which are used in industries. We will see the majorly the moving bed reactors, the fixed bed reactors, then based on the phases whether it is gas liquid phases or gas phase reactors then uh, whether you have a monolith reactors, all this will be taken up uh, in the uh, due course of time. So we should be able to know which reactor needs to be used for a, which application, that is very important aspect. So as chemical engineers, you know the kinetics and from the kinetics, you govern or you decide based on the kinetics and the enthalpies, what reactor or catalyst you need to choose. So what is heterogeneous catalysis? So I, I, I have written here chemical reaction engineering so workhorse. So workhorse means this is the principal form of reactions which are occurring in chemical engineering that heterogeneous catalysis. So had name suggest heterogeneous catalysis is the two separate catalyst is loaded separately. So uh, the other one is homogeneous catalyst. So we have seen I will be seeing this particular catalysis in the next module. So we will see the homogeneous transition metal catalysis. So mainly they will be homogeneous means which is the single phase and they to tend to be on a smaller scale and more targeted. When I talk about smaller scale and more targeted, it implies that we need to produce certain compounds which are targeted means in requiring small quantities or fine chemicals. And for the bulk chemicals, the heterogeneous catalysis is more adept. So heterogeneous catalysis in a continuous process are often preferred in industrial catalysis from an engineering standpoint of view. Why I write engineering? Why? Because of these three reasons. Catalyst separation is easier with heterogeneous catalysis than with homogeneous catalysis. So you can easily take out the catalyst, then push a fresh batch of catalyst or you can regenerate the catalyst. Suppose sometimes what happens on the catalyst, some coke particles deposit. So what you can do? You can uh, just put it on a stream of uh, air or steam and it will just oxidize and then you put back the catalyst into the reactor. Regeneration, like now I told, regeneration is more flexible. So if this catalyst is re to be regenerated, regenerated means suppose sometimes what happens is the catalyst during the reaction gets sometimes, uh, you know, some of the particles like reactants and products sit on the active site. So we need to remove these particles. So is it something the most easy is to burn them off. If you burn them off, you do combustion you burn them off and you get the fresh catalyst back, this is the regeneration part. The cost, cost is less expensive, that is primarily due to the reason of the previous two 
that is the separation is easier you don't need catalyst again and again to be loaded in the reactor so it is economical now the first aspect which we will take up is the catalyst design so when selecting a catalyst it is impossible it is important to consider both the reaction kinetics and the diffusion rates of the reactants and products so it means like something like you have this a catalyst particle okay so the reactants will come out he will come here the reactant particles they will react onto the surface and then they will diffuse ice the products will diffuse out so this reactant particle obviously when the it is another phase and the solid the catalyst phase so one is the reaction part which is governed by the reaction kinetics the other part is the products the products once they are formed it should diffuse out from the catalyst layer into the bulk so that is called the diffusion rates so both are important unfortunately most of the r&d is involved in improving the catalyst performance but regarding the improvement of the mass transfer rates not much has been done because uh, there are some limitations what we can do we can increase the kinetic or the rate of the reaction so there are different reactors which exert different demands on the catalyst so it is very difficult to choose the catalyst size and the shape irrespective of the reactor type so let me just elaborate what i mean by this point in a fixed bed reactor usually we have big particles so if there are big particles big particles are fine because it reduces pressure drop but on the other hand your area is less the available surface area for reaction is less so your conversion is not that good but you are uh, being a big particle you have another advantage is that the heat transfer rate which is obtained you know it is easily uh, it is less it can be easily dissipated heat control may be easier but in fluidized part particle you know we you need tiny particles so if you have tiny particles then the surface to volume ratio will be higher so in your reaction kinetics or the reaction rate will also be higher so you yeah, but then the tiny particles of some other issues it will have some pressure drop high pressure drop so you have both ways you have to choose a compromise whether you want to higher conversion or a lower thermal performance or you need to have a more reaction or more conversion however given the constraints imposed by reactor time an optimum solution is conceivable so what is the optimum solution it will depend upon the catalyst size and shape so we'll come to that so let me see what is reaction rate you have studied in your undergraduate Uh, probably before this prior to this course you must have studied reaction engineering so you know the reaction rates are affected by particle size so it's basically constituting the our chemical reaction engineering part 2 for those undergraduates so in that you have seen that the smaller particles requires less time for the reactants to reach the active catalyst size so if you have small particle of catalyst the reactant can easily get on top of the active site of the catalyst okay and then the products once formed easily diffuses away from this active site so diffusion is also less but if you have a bigger particle size the catalyst efficiency may be reduced by the fact that the reactants may never reach the interior of the particle so this is for a bigger particle size okay bigger catalyst particle so the internal effective factors we define so you have you should be familiar with this we will be discussing what we call as internal effective factor so what is this it's the ratio between the observed reaction rate okay to the rate without internal gradients so what is what are these two observed reaction rate is an average of the rates inside the particle so it is inside the particle whatever is happening so when you have in so temperatures and concentration are c and t so units will be for this rate is moles per second per meter cube of the particle volume okay now this is the reaction rate at surface on the surface what is happening so one it one is inside what is happening one is on the surface what is happening so obviously this uh, should be very higher so on the surface it should be less inside the catalyst size will be there so it means inside the path is where the reaction happens so the ratio should be higher this should be higher 
So let us see what if it is higher what happens to the Thiele modulus because Thiele modulus also you know what, what it is. So the internal effective act factor we can relate it to the generalized Thiele modulus. So for a nth order reaction we have this expression. So the internal effective factor is equal to V upon SA. So V upon SA is the volume to external surface area of a catalyst. So for sphere this is RP by 3 which is the RP is the particle radius. KV is the intrinsic reaction rate coefficient which is per unit volume. D effective is the effective diffusion rate of the molecule and C is the concentration of the catalyst surface. So if you see Cs is here V by SA this belongs to the catalyst property. Okay. So we have catalyst property outside and the remaining all inside within the square root which is due to the reaction kinetics. So let us see what happens if I plot these two together with respect to Thiele modulus. So if you plot these together the effectiveness further and this uh, I just go back just make sure that so this is the internal uh, effectiveness factor versus so if you what you have is you have to have a pretty high effectiveness factor close to unity but the issue is uh, uh, you also need to have a high effect uh, internal effectiveness factor. So the issue is uh, what they say is the Thiele modulus should be around 0 0.5 it should be less than or equal to 0 0.5 for diffusion for diffusional resistance to be minimum okay so that's why i have put out a plot and it is close to 0 0.5 so this will be around 0 0.5 so it means uh, you should not go beyond this 0 0.5 and the effectiveness flow should be close to 1 so if i draw a line uh, to this point because I have drawn here such that it is around close to 100 percent internal eff the effectiveness. So you have a region which is given by the shaded portion where we need to choose the particle according to this size. So you here from here you will come to know about the V by surface area. So you just now recollect what I have just now discussed Thiele modulus is defined as the ratio as you must be knowing Thiele modulus is defined as the ratio between the activity of the catalyst and the diffusion rate. So when I talk about the activity of the catalyst it means I am talking about both that together I mean we are talking about both the activity inside the catalyst and outside the catalyst as well. So Thiele modulus it says must be sufficiently small usually 0 0.5 in order for divisional constraints to be insignificant which implies that the effectiveness factor must be close to unity. The existing processes is almost certainly see an increase in catalyst activity in the future but mass transfer is more difficult to control because to or enhance fundamentally. So we see that they are saying is that with the increasing R&D you have the reaction uh, kinetics or the catalyst preparation more and more R&D is going on how to improve the uh, reaction conversion selectivity but not much can be done about the mass transfer diffusion. As a result mass transfer is projected to become a more pressing problem in the future. So diffusion and heat transmission because the diffusion will also transfer the heat so these two will dictate the surface area to volume ratio. So obviously for this to be much much higher you need the particle size to be as small as possible. So it means if you want to this ratio to be as high as possible you need a particle size as small as possible because as V decreases SA increases. So SA by V is to be very high higher value. Catalysts so what the industrial people and what the R&D efforts are doing so they are preparing catalyst so that you increase the SA by V ratio. So catalysts come in a wide variety of forms and sizes each with its own surface area to volume ratio. So catalyst performance is not only dependent on the catalyst surface area but we find we are getting the ratio to be higher and higher but is that enough? Is that only the factor? No because some reactors like fixed bed reactors the pressure drop is also come into play. So if you make a size I mean smaller particles if you make or insert in a fixed bed reactor they will cause a higher uh, pressure drop okay, in a fixed bed reactor as compared to larger particle. So smaller particles why am I saying in the smaller particle your uh, uh, SA by V will be very high but your pressure drop then also becomes very high. So the, if this is low 
your pressure drop will become lower. So particle size and surface by volume area is inversely proportional and again it is inversely proportional to the pressure drop. So smaller particle higher pressure drop, larger particle lower pressure drop. Catalyst strength is a significant consideration in the fixed bed and moving bed reactors. Because of the pressure decrease, the particle must be end. So now the issue is uh, because of uh, now the particles, even if we find out the optimum size, they must be able to ensure being compressed together by the bed above them. So it means suppose we are putting together in a bed all the catalyst particles. Now they will be compressed within each other. So if you have a smaller particle and if you are, it is not hollow, if it is a solid catalyst particle, the crushing load will be much high. Okay. So if the crushing load is much high, then it will be a problem. The crushing strength of the compact particles is stronger than hollow ones and it rises with particle size. Another important aspect which we need to say is the mechanical properties. The mechanical properties is also important. So the mechanical properties means the attrition resistance. Attrition resistance. So it implies how the two particles are coming in contact with each other. For example, in a fluidized bed, in a fluidized bed, to minimize the attrition res uh, resistance, fluidized bed reactor. To minimize this, what you do is in this, you take the particle size or the catalyst particle size to between 30 to 150 micrometer. While the same thing when you do for a fixed bed, so most of the particles should be within this range so as to minimize the attrition resistance. While in a fixed bed reactor, size are a bit higher to the higher end, I will write in terms of millimeter it was micrometer, this is 2 to 6 millimeter and no fines should be there. So there should be no fine particles. So see now this fluidized base requires a smaller particle size because the pressure drop then becomes higher and the fixed bed requires a larger particle size, larger particles means easy heat dissipation and there should be no fines. So this is another important aspect to be considered while you design a catalyst, the crushing strength and the mechanical properties primarily the attrition resistance. So these are the different catalyst uh, designs. So these have been, uh, this is also available in this book. So this, let us say this is spherical. So this spherical is like uh, what we have seen in the fluidized bed. What they do when I have written the previous slide, so 30 to 150 micrometer. So the fluidized bed reactor should have catalyst particle based on sphere, sometimes they are also called as microspheres, micro Then you have pellets, then you have cylindrical extrudate, then you have trilobe. So these are used in different, different application. And then this hollow extrudate, when you have this hollow, see this is the region which is hollow or you have ring is a hollow, this will actually reduce the crushing strength because the particle on top of the particular catalyst particle it is hollow. So the amount of pressure it will put on the adjacent layer will be less. Then again wagon wheel type of and then monolith. The monolith are uh, something like a ceramic support on which the catalyst is coated. So they are channels, predefined channels. You make this channel so that the catalyst is coated onto the channels and then the feeds pass through these channels and you have get products and the outer end or the output as the product. So these are the different catalyst, uh, you know, the particle size which is available in industry. So catalyst design, so ultimately what we have seen so far, economics of the production process necessitates reasonable manufacturing cost. The novel catalyst shapes are more costly to make. So the catalyst shape just now you saw, they are most costly to make since they need a lot of time and resources. While the reaction rate reduces when the surface area to volume ratio lowers, the pressure drop and manufacturing cost both decrease as a result of increasing particle size. Now okay fine I want to make a catalyst particle, 
I should be having a higher particle size so that the surface area to volume reduces. So I am good when I consider the pressure drop and the heat transmission but I am in a loss because the reaction rate is decreased. So manufacturing is less costly so that I have written it is a manufacturing cost decreases. So a compromise needs to be there depending on the reactor type a compromise between high reaction rate small particle. Novel shape means whether it is hollow or solid low pressure drop low pressure drop can be obtained for a large particle shape high crushing strength low porosity. So if you have a particular catalyst size which is hollow or having low porosity so they will be better so it means they will be having lesser uh, crushing strength. I am sorry it is the other way around high crushing strength means it will have low porosity high porosity means it will have lower crushing strength. Then a low manufacturing cost is primarily if we have large particle size to be prepared. So all these factors okay the particle size then the crushing strength low pressure drop manufacturing cost will be taken into account. So determination of the final catalyst size and shape is then prepared. So when you do a optimum performance study between all these factors. So now after the catalyst we start with the reactor type. What are the reactor types? See the design of a heterogeneous catalyst reactor depends on several factors. So those who have done the fluid mechanics or those who have done something based on heterogeneous catalysis or computational fluid dynamics they will come to know that it will depend upon the flow types, the number and kind of phases which are involved and the volume fraction of the individual phases. So how much of gas phase, how much of liquid phase is there that is very important. Then the contact patterns whether it is co-current, counter-current, cross-current flow this must be taken into consideration. The reaction kinetics is very important because we need to know the nth order kinetic what should be the conversion or what should be the reactor size. So reaction kinetics because it will also determine the temperature, some side reactions, the concentration profile and the residence time duration. The residence time duration will also determine the degree of mixing. Okay. Then we also need to know the reaction enthalpy. So what is the amount of energy which is getting out after the reaction or from a side reaction that we should know so that you should have adequate control of the reactor, thermal control of the reactor so heat transfer measures needs to be adopted. The deactivation of the catalyst is also an important property because a key design and technical consideration is how often the catalyst is added and removed. So whether we require the catalyst maybe whatever we prepare the catalyst they may be deactivated because of intense pressure and temperature. Sometimes you know what happens is this catalyst gets sintered because your coke formation takes place on top of it. Why coke formation takes place? Because a lot of aromatic compounds get settled or they forms due to side reactions. So you have carbon to hydrogen ratio to be very very high. So in that case coke gets formed on the catalyst. So it is almost as good as lost or sometimes there may be poison such as sulphur may poison the catalyst or nitrogen may poison the catalyst then also you have to replace. So you have to find out what till frequently how frequently you need to catalyst needs to be added and removed. So if you see there are some reactors type which I am just now it is there the solid catalyst gas space. So you have the um, feed coming here and of the product coming here this is a simple fixed bed reactor what you do this cross portion you have this catalyst particles in it and you send the feed on the top get the product the down okay this is a, all the solid catalyzed gas phase reaction. So the reaction is considering in the gas phase. Then uh, there may be a fixed bed reactor with a combustion zone. So suppose you burn the air and oxygen and you send the feed from here and you get the product here. So you have to burn the fuel with the air you burn it here and then uh, there is a catalyst bed it passes through and finally it lets out from the reactor. Then uh, sometimes what happens is you require uh, somehow okay fine these two previous ones are fine but you need a good isothermal profile within the reactor. One way of doing is rather than to send it uh, directly I mean axially you send it radially. So if you see the feed when it enters here it is sent radially it means there are some baffles here so the feed just comes here out like this it comes out here so the heat is dissipated somehow this constant. So there are should not be no local hot spot. So hot spots may be present here hot spots. Hot spots means 
suddenly some point where the temperature is very very high. So these and these may be having some hotspot, but in this they try to avoid this hotspot. Then monolith reactors is uh, it is very much useful nowadays in the in our car we have this monolith uh, reactor. What happens is it will actually do the pollution abatement. It is the conversion of SOX and NOX basically. So that way what they, they do is they use this monolith type of catalyst structures. The monolith type of catalyst such as something like this if I want to draw it and this is interconnecting these are some ceramic support and the catalyst is somewhere here it is the catalyst is present it is coated it is wash coated onto this surface. So these channels keeps on extending throughout. So, it will get an optimum pressure drop and also due to the point that these channels are uniform, it will ensure a continuous supply with uh, no entrapment of the catalyst particles. So, now reactor types, it is possible to customize each reactor type with several tiny diameter tubes, a varied gas liquid pattern and temperature control mechanism. For certain processes, both gas phase and liquid phase operation may be used simultaneously. So, I mean what happens is suppose you have a reactor and uh, you have exothermic reaction going on. So, a lot of heat is generated. If a heat is generated, you cannot keep it like this otherwise it will just explode with the high temperature. So, what you do instead of putting it in a bed, what you do you put some several tiny diameter tubes let us suppose. In the tube, what you do in the through the tube? you do the reaction and outside the tube you send some liquid a boiling liquid so that it will transfer the heat out. So, that is also one way of going about the exothermic reactions. So, we have range of options temperature control is feasible due to a lower concentration that may be employed when utilizing a solvent in the liquid phase. However, the low diffusion rate. So, uh, temperature control may be if you want do not want to do a reaction in a gas phase medium you may add liquid in it. If it is liquid the temperature may be controlled, but if the reaction takes place in the liquid phase the problem is again the diffusion because the products needs to be diffusing through the liquid phase into the main gas phase. Then again the diffusional constraint will come. So, that is the thing you have to decide based on the economics of the process. In industry the adiabatic fixed bed reactors are the most popular form of reactor. It is basically a cylindrical container we will see some figures in the next slide in which the catalyst particles are randomly placed. So, adiabatic reactor for use with solid catalyst they have been already used because an important advantage is they have the largest catalytic loading per reactor volume ok. So, these are the different uh, moving bed catalyst I would say. So, what do you mean by moving bed means your catalyst is getting regenerated ok. So, now this is way you do I mean you have a moving bed reactor here. So, you have the catalyst bed here. So, the catalyst bed is here. So, when the feed comes in a separate channel. So, reaction occurs in this bed and the product gets out from here, but in the case of catalyst. So, sometimes let us say 2 or 3 years you need to replace them. So, what do you do? Do you totally take out and put the plant in a shutdown mode? No, what you do is you take out the catalyst slowly, slowly here, take it out, you do a catalyst regeneration as I told you because many catalysts may have uh, cook particles on it. So, you can uh, either um, uh, this catalyst regeneration means you do those operation maybe combustion or steam reforming whatever you want to do you just take out the carbon out of it. The so, carbon out of it, it means you had such processes I have clubbed them together and it is under catalyst regeneration. So, you add the fresh catalyst because uh, you may not be all of them. Uh, so, you may be losing some catalyst here. So, you add the fresh catalyst to make up catalyst and then you send it again back. So, this particular region is to separate out any fines and then send it back to the catalyst is a moving bed reactor. Fluidized bed reactors you know these are all in fluidized state this is a dense phase with catalyst these are the gas bubbles. So, these are the catalyst these are the gas bubble. So, you have the feed coming here sent in counter current form. So, it is upward direction to send. So, you can that is the common most common application of fluidized bed you send it in upward direction. So, what you happen is this catalyst particle again may you know it may um, because of the issues it may 
not work properly or it may clog also. So, what you do is take out this from here and add here. So, that is also one way of regenerating the catalyst. Then the entrain flow means you send the feed upward. So, all the particles are entrained in this bed. Then the product comes out, you take a cyclone separator out here, cyclone separator, cyclone separator out here, take out the product and the remaining particle solids comes out here, all the catalyst comes down here. You send the similar catalyst regeneration as I discussed in moving bed reactor and send back to the reactor. So, this is sometimes called as the entrain flow reactor similar to fluidized bed reactor. So, uh, what are the different uh, flows we have seen with different phase flow? You may have one phase flow which allows the fluid to go up, down or radially through the bed. Downward flow is the most prevalent. To reduce the pressure drop across the bed, radial flow is occasionally used. Additional to pressure drop, your temperature profile also increases. As flow rates are generally high, upward flow is seldom used because it might result in the movement of catalyst particles that are not required. Two phase flow offers the option of operating in either a downhill, upward or counter current. Now we are coming to two phase flow. Okay. So, most common configuration in the two phase or a three phase flow is the trickle bed reactor. So, where is this used? The trickle bed reactor is used for the hydro desulphurization of heavy oils. It means it is used to remove the heteroatom present in the heavy oil. So, these are the different solid catalyzed gas liquid reaction reactors. So, this is the trickle bed reactor. So, you have liquid phase and gas phase coming together and meeting this. So, you have solid phase, gas phase and a solid phase is catalyst, liquid phase, gas phase coming together and finally giving the product. Or you may also operate the trickle bed in terms of monolith reactor. You have the solid phase if present in the catalyst here, solid phase. They are monolith reactors. These are normal react monolith catalyst. These are normal catalyst. Or you can also have three phase fluidized bed. In terms of fluidized bed, also you can three head. So, what it is looks like you have a liquid phase here, gas phase here, the solid particle is within the fluidized phase. So, the reaction takes place in the gas phase, in the gas bubbles, and then the products are separated from the top. Okay. Or you can also have this common which we have studied in chemical reaction engineering. So, catalyst is in suspension, you have baffles to increase the mixing. You have a cooling jacket, you have sent the gas phase here, you send the liquid phase here. So, the liquid product is kept out from the, is taken out from the top, gas is coming out from the top. So, it gets gas and liquid get separated. So, these are different, uh, you know, solid catalyzed gas liquid reactions. So, everywhere the solid particles are present, whether it is in a fluidized state or in a fixed state. Based on that, the reactors are operated. So, what are the different reactor types which are used in industry? When I talk of fixed bed reactors, these are the different application. You can have hydro desulphurization of naphtha, catalytic reforming. Catalytic reforming you must be knowing. So, what you do is you break the long chain, long chain into smaller chains. So, it is like a you form a particular carbonium ion and from that carbonium ion you break that and because it is easier to break them into smaller particles and then treat them. So, there is catalytic reforming is there. So, whether you add steam in that you add steam and some catalyst to do the reforming process. If it is in the presence of steam, steam reforming. If it is in the presence of water gas shift reaction. So, in this case you actually produce thin gas, then methanation, then ammonia synthesis we have discussed already and the methanol synthesis. All this uses fixed bed reactor. Then there are uh, monolith reactor where they are used as I told you exhaust glass cleaning in automobiles. Fixed bed with combustion zone, these are another reactor which are used in autothermic reforming. Uh, then you have radial flow reactors used in either catalytic reforming or the methanol synthesis. Then the moving bed reactor, catalytic reforming, continuous regenerative process. Then the fluidized bed reactor we just now discussed is used in the fluidized crack catalytic cracking process. And entrain flow reactor also used in the modern fluidized catalytic, catalytic process. Okay. Then there, let us look at the gas liquid reactors. Those trickle bed reactors, as I told you, is used in the HDS of heavy oil fraction. Then a moving bed reactors in the hydrogenation of residue, which means we remove the metal from the oil. Then it can be also be used as a three phase fluidized bed reactor, hydrogenation of residues. Okay. So, all these three reactor types are used in the case of gas liquid phase 
reaction. So when we discuss the reactor types, the moving bed reactor is identical to the fixed bed reactor. So the issue is the gravitational forces can cause the catalyst bed to sink towards the floor. So the fluid phase may flow. So there are, so the design is a bit difficult because the moving bed reactor, if you have a catalyst, it may tend to sink downhill toward the floor. Then you can also consider the fluid phase which may flow either vertically or horizontally because even if flows vertically or horizontally, it is circulating the catalyst becomes difficult. But then it also opens the door to continual catalyst renewal. Okay. So some of them are of limited use, for example, regenerative reforming and the bunker reaction in the shell high-con process for the catalytic dehydrogenator residual oil fraction are the two examples. So this is some of the example. So in this case, in the continuous regenerating process, what they do is they will take uh, the uh, isomers, will produce isomers, for example, such as like this, this type of reactions or you may have uh, reactions such as So it means this shell's high con process okay, actually carries out these two reactions, the isomerization primarily to isomerization reaction. So where the fluid flow, fluid phase may flow either vertically or horizontally, okay, that is where the limited use is there. It is used in the shell high con process. Then there are monolithic reactors which are called as structure reactors because of the, uh, the catalyst, I, I have told you the catalyst how they are produced. So these are wash coated and they are present in the layers inside the channels. These are called structured reactors. They are made of ceramic or metal that have parallel channels coated with the catalyst. So the low pressure drop in the monolithic reactors make them ideal for the gas phase reactions. So the shell high con process if I go ahead and also what they do with in the regenerative reforming I have already discussed the shell high con process is of the type as I already told you this is the hydroprocessing reaction primarily used for the hydroprocessing reaction. So it will just simply convert to so these are the shell high con process hydrogen conversion hydroprocessing or hydrogen conversion process. So these reaction, this and this are the regenerating reforming because they have limited use. So that is why they may be used uh, in this case where there is a vertical or a horizontal flow where a continuous catalyst renewal is required. Then uh, we have the fluidized bed. The flowing gas, liquid gas and liquid in fluidized bed causes the catalyst particle to flow in a random fashion. This is also called as ebullated bed reactor. The advantage is the reactor heat transmission and ease of catalyst removal. The fluidized bed procedures, it includes a catalytic cracking, a catalyst renewal in a catalytic cracking and a LC fine process for the catalytic dehydrogenation of residues. So this we have catalytic cracking and we have already discussed okay, previously. So LC fine is a name, a proprietary name, this is the company which is given is Lumus. Lumus is the company which actually have used this L LC fine process. They have developed the catalyst. So these are uses for the fluidized bed. So if you increase the gas flow velocity in a gas fluidized bed reactor, it will result in catalyst particles being entrained by the flow. Then such flow reactor is called as entrained flow reactor. Catalysts that deactivate quickly may be used in these reactors because of their high activity. So it means the entrain flow reactor, you can use those catalysts which deactivates very quickly. For example, the FCC process requires a zeolite catalyst. Zeolite catalyst, I will tell what are zeolites in the next, next lecture. The solid catalyzed bulk chemical manufacturing does not often use mechanically stirred tent reactor. The mechanical stirred reactor, if you recall in the previous slide, the last reactor. So these are fine chemicals, they are mostly produced in these reactors. So these are not much of use, only for fine chemicals they are utilized. So another important aspect is the heat exchanger, how the heat is exchanged in fixed bed reactors. The fixed bed reactors have rather low heat transfer properties. So because of the size of the particles, the harvest to volume ratio is low resulting in a small heat transfer, heat transfer, heat transmission area. In addition, 
Catalyst materials are often thermal insulators. Temperature management in fixed bed reactor is difficult, resulting in non isothermal temperature profile in both the axial and radial direction. So, you understand if you have these small particles, so it means the heat removal is very difficult. So, you will have a non isothermal profile whether in axial or radial direction. So, you have the risk of local hot spots. For liquid phase temperature gradients in reactors, so if one way of getting out of this is use liquid, but in the for liquid phase temperature gradients in reactors are far lower than in gas phase operation. This is one way out, but then again the diffusion is a problem of the products. The adiabatic fixed reactor is only suited for reactions with a low heat impact and where the temperature change caused by the reaction has no influence on the selectivity. Okay. If the adiabatic temperature rise and fall in an adiabatic fixed bed reactor, suppose the temperature in adiabatic fixed bed reactor becomes too high with the temperature of the reaction, then we can do is a sequence of small adiabatic fixed beds can be made with intermediate chilling or heating. So, we will see what do we mean by that. So, this is what it looks like. So, you have feed here, you have the catalyst bed here. So, you have the H and C, it means intermediate heating and cooling, then again to the next reactor, again intermediate heating, cooling, again the next reactor and finally the products. Or within the same reactor, you can cool, you can put a cooler inside so that it can cool down the gases. This we have seen in, uh, you know, in the sulfuric acid. So, intermediate coolers are there. Then uh, you can also send a cool feed directly, cold feed instead of cold feed, you apply cold feed from the side stream in addition to the top stream that also reduces or manages the temperatures pretty well. So, these are called quench reactors and these are called what you call these are adiabatic reactors with intermediate heating and cooling. So, both these arrangements are used in industries. So, heat transmission in a particular reactor must occur throughout the reactor the process necessary at precise temperature control as in, in the case with highly exothermic or endothermic process. Such reactions are well suited to multi-tubular reactors. So, heat transfer is often achieved by using hundreds to thousands of tubes that are surrounded by the heat transfer medium. So, if you have number of tubes and in these tubes the feeds and products get converted, the feed converted to products and the outside of these tubes the liquid flows, the hot liquid flows which takes away the heat. Heat transfer medium that is the boiling fluids flows around the tubes in an exothermic reaction chamber. Baffles guide these flow through the tubes to keep the temperature stable. So, almost isothermal operation may be accomplished using this technique. The partial oxidation of ethene is one such example which actually uses a multi-tubular tubes within the reactor. So, oxidation of ethene will give ethene oxide. It is possible to perform high temperature endothermic reaction in tubes placed in a furnace. Another way to get this was about exothermic. Endothermic reaction can also be used if you keep those tubes inside a reactor and you have a furnace beneath it. The steam reforming of methane or naphtha is a common example of this process. So, let us see in figures what we have. So, these are the two reactors. So, see this multi-tubular fixed bed reactor. What, the, what it does? These are the different tubes. So, you have the feed they will come out here. Okay. And then the product also comes out here. So, in between uh, you have a uh, sorry not this one. So, all will come on the blue part and then the one which is in between it is the heat exchanger fluid it will take out the heat and vent out from here. So, you have baffles here to have good mixing. So, it will take out basically the heat. So, you have the product here. So, this way this is a multiple tube. This is taken in methane reforming. Ah, okay, this methane reforming is one such example. And uh, I am sorry, just a second, I uh, just want to get back to the previous slide. Sorry, this should be the methane reforming, this should be the ethene to ethene oxide, ethene to ethene oxide, the example. While this is the case which is the case for methane reforming, methane reforming. So, if you see uh, you know you have the feed here the methane gas coming inside CH4. 
So you have the product coming out but for the product to coming out you require a lot of heat for the methane reforming. So that heat is produced in the bottom part of the reactor. So bottom part of the reactor provide the fuels and they will burn this particular feed and the reaction will take place in that shaded radiant which is made in the ash color. So whatever flue gases will be taken up from the upward direction so you get the product. So this is called the methane reforming it uses a tubular reformer. So this is a tubular reformer this is a multi-tubular fixed bed reactor. So then moving ahead the moving bed reactor solid catalyzed circulate in moving bed reactors limiting the temperature gradients to a certain extent comparable to fixed bed reactors. In terms of heat transmission slurry reactors can also be used. It is possible to achieve high heat transfer rates the catalytic sizes which increases the heat transfer area. Back mixing the catalyst makes the reactors temperature uniform. So there is an option of installing additional cooling and heating coils within the unit. So the entrained flow reactors have gray high have heat transfer characteristic that falls somewhere in the middle of fluidized bed and moving bed reactors just now I have explained. By allowing for heat exchanger via evaporation, multiphase operation provides good temperature control. For example, a multipurpose multiphase operation may be preferable than a single gas based reaction. So if you use tubes and the surrounding liquid by a boiling liquid, so it will evaporate, the boiling liquid will evaporate and so it will just remove all the heat, okay. So it removes the heat, so this is the best way for allowing heat exchange. Then the final part of this lecture is the catalyst deactivation. There may be a loss of catalyst activity with time, catalyst may be poisoned or it may be sintered. So there is a chemical deactivation and thermal deactivation. Catalyst deactivation mainly due to the presence of reactants, intermediates or products when they react with each other on the surface of the catalyst. Coke is formed as I told you earlier aromatic molecules are formed on the catalyst surface which can because it undergoes condensation such as and processes such as cycloaddition, dehydrogenation to create massive structures with low hydrogen concentration of coke. For this it requires reducing atmosphere, high temperature, low hydrogen pressure all of which are present in ad advance. So if you have these conditions high temperature, low hydrogen pressure or if you have all these conditions it is the perfect recipe for creation of coke on the catalyst surface. Especially high temperature endothermic process which are greater than 750 Kelvin such as FCC, catalytic reforming and steam reforming all have issues with coke deposition hence the catalyst renewal or catalyst deactivation is a major issue in these processes. Steam cracking of ethane and naphtha produces also coke by thermal processes hydrogen either as hydro. So what is the way out? You can add up hydrogen gas to reduce the reaction. So if you add the hydrogen gas in terms of hydrogen or H2 it may use to reduce the production of coke because the coke will re react with hydrogen to form methane. So the coke will be consumed or this if you do a reforming with water it will produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So then also your uh, this carbon content is reduced because it is getting formed to CO2 this is one way. So either you increase the hydrogen gas or you do a reforming with water you reduce the coke content. Coke formation is reduced and thus the conversion of methane to syn gas is boosted by the utilization of extra steam in steam reforming. Another process is the catalytic reformers, so during reforming hydrogen is produced. So addition of hydrogen decreases the feed co conversion. So as I told you in the catalytic reforming process you have hydrogen. So there should be a balance between catalytic reactive conversion. So if you have hydrogen if you add hydrogen or you produce hydrogen conversion will be decreasing but your catalyst will remain active. But then uh, the conversion decreases so catalyst deactivation is gradual simple adiabatic flow reactors may be employed. So you use a simple adiabatic fixed bed reactor if the equilibrium conversion is low. Lower hydrogen pressure raises the cost of investment owing to the need of moving bed reactor which is much more difficult to build and operate but on the other hand the conversion is increased. Okay, because if you take out the hydrogen, lower hydrogen pressure means less of hydrogen. So the conversion is increased. Okay, the conversion is increased, but it will require more investment owing to the need of a moving bed reactor because of the catalyst. Because you need to replace the catalyst because the catalyst will be deactivated. So you need to replace the catalyst means you need to separate out the catalyst. Recyclability is improved and expenses are reduced. So all these factors you need to take care before you decide on the 
uh, which process do you want to add more of hydrogen or you want to use another reactor to recycle the catalyst. So, these are the different uh, catalyst deactivation processes happening in industry. So, for steam reformers there are uh, steam reforming reactions, excel steam addition needs to be done after the end of 2 years. The reactors they use is tubular fixed bed reactors. In catalytic reformers you may be either semi regenerative, fully regenerative or continuous regenerative. Semi regenerative has large hydrogen to carbon ratio. So, the amount uh, the so you know the activation is increased to 400 days. So, you have large hydrogen to carbon ratio. So, if you have more hydrogen conversion is reduced, but the duration of catalyst renewal is 400 days. This can be seen is multiple fixed bed reactors. Then fully regenerative, it may have moderate hydrogen to HC ratio, the ref catalyst the activation duration is days 2 weeks, these are available in multiple fixed bed reactor with swing reactor. Then continuous regenerative, it says moderate hydrogen to carbon ratio, days and weeks, it is in days and weeks the activation duration, moving bed reactor and in FCC type of reactions, you usually have regenerative reactions. So, in seconds, it will collapse, I mean you have to regenerate. So, these are uh, usually used in entrant flow reactor that catalyst deactivates in seconds. So, catalyst overall the catalyst deactivation is usually the sintering process, poisoning process and the how the mixing of reactants is done. So, catalyst deactivation is through uh, sintering then the, so it means mainly occurs sintering of the catalyst due to the maldistribution of the fluid phases and the incomplete wetting of the catalyst particles in a trickle bed reactors. Poisoning means the adsorbing impurities in the feed, if there are feed there are some impurities, they may adsorb onto the catalyst site. Sulphur is a common toxin in ammonia, ethane, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide production. These are usually seen in process such as catalytic reforming of platinum catalyst, steam reforming and the synthesis of ammonia with iron catalyst. So, the purification of the feed is very important to reduce the risk of poisoning. Hydro desulphurization is an example of a sulphur removal process before it is sent to the catalytic process. Using a water gas shift reaction, carbon dioxide absorption and a final methanation step, synthesis gas may be cleaned of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide for use in the manufacture of ammonia. Then the mixing of reactants, so uh, fluidized bed reactors versus PFR versus CSTR, how you want to mix the reactants. So for example, if you want to conduct a reaction A to B and B then B to C, and if B is your product, primary product, so in order to not to proceed with C, so usually plug flow reactors are required because the initial conversion is very high. So, as you increase the concentration of the reactants, the concentration is very high. So, it means the conversion is very high, sorry, the conversion is very high. So, you should take the use of PFR, but then uh, the further reaction should not happen. So, you should take care, you should remove the heat so that the further reaction, runaway reaction does not happen and produces C. So, in the CSTR uh, something like that, we for a equal volume and for an another reaction, so you need to use always a PFR in such cases. But then the PFR requires a heat removal mechanism so that C does not get formed. So, what it is final, I will conclude the exothermic reactions can lead to runaway reactions when cooling is not sufficient. In a trickle bed reactor, even distribution of the liquid of the catalyst bed is important. Liquid maldistribution can lead to local hotspots, temperature can rise in the entire reactor and total runaway reaction can happen. So, the scaling up after all these studies fixed been found that fixed bed reactors are simpler to scale up from the lab scale to the full scale operation. Fluidized bed are difficult because fluidization features of the bed are not only dependent on the local parameters, but also on the reactor size. It is easy to scale up pilot reactors of 13 to 14 millimeter diameter to full scale reactors of 3 to 9 meter diameter. Fluidized bed reactors of these many diameters 7.5 to 17 meter diameter, the scale up takes multiple phases, each one or phases or steps, I will say steps, steps, each step or phases one or two orders of magnitude greater than the preceding one. So, amount of scaling up in the case of fluidized bed reactor is very difficult as compared to normal pilot bed or the fixed bed reactor. So, I will conclude here. So, please go through this first reference, most of the textual matter and the discussion has been taken from the book, the textbook from the chemical process technology from Maulin. And then uh, the shell con process, okay, the shell con 
shell residue or the shell cone process you can see from here or you can also see a lot many catalysts and how the process is developed the shell residue conjugate of the process in this article thank you mm -hmm.